eternity with you. God, I pray that we would fix our eyes on you. So many times we get consumed by everything else going on in life that we miss the most important thing, which is you. God, I pray that you would be our first option, not our last resort. God, I pray that you would be the one that we hunger after. You would be the one that we thirst after. You would be the one that we wake up in the morning thinking about. You would be the one that during the day would consume our thoughts. God, when we're going through a trial that we would would think about you, when we're celebrating a victory that we'd think about you. God, I pray that you would be our everything. And in that, you can transform everything in us. Because God, the truth is we need to be transformed. The truth is, God, we're far from perfect. And we need you. Lord, I pray this morning as we open up your word that our hearts, our minds will be open to receive from you the God that loves, the God who judges, the God who we need. And God, I pray that if this morning we need correction, that we'd be corrected. That if this morning we need encouragement, we'd, give, we'd have find encouragement. That this morning, if we need salvation, that we'd find salvation. God, come and do what only you can do, we pray. And in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated this morning. Good to see you all today. Oh, it's nice to see you guys. The last number of weeks, uh, we've been walking through the most famous sermon in all of sermons, in all of the world, in all of history, and, it, and it's not a sermon from any pastor, it's, it's Jesus' sermon, it's the Sermon on the Mount. And, and if you're new here, let me just paint this picture for you real quick. For about 30 years, and Jesus is walking on this earth, he kind of lived the life in relative obscurity. We don't know much about his growing up life. You know, every once in a while, he would show up to the temple, and he would drop some knowledge on the Pharisees, and drop some knowledge on, on, on the priests and the rabbis, and be like, oh my gosh, who is this kid? This guy, he knows some stuff. But there's a lot of his growing up life, his young adult life, we really don't know anything about. Out. And the reason for that was it wasn't his time yet. He, he, there was a time when he was to step forward, show the world who he was, and then live that out. And it wasn't time yet. So, so he, was, he was just living a normal life. But then now we have seen Jesus, he steps out in his authority, he steps out in his purpose, and he begins to show the world who he is, he begins to teach. And in Matthew chapter 4, we see him going from city to city, town to town, and, and he's teaching. And you got to imagine this, that the greatest teacher in the history of the world, and he's, he's dropping this knowledge on people, and they're sitting there, they're astounded, they're, they're just, oh my gosh, I can't believe what he's saying and how it connects these dots, and how it makes sense. And if that wasn't enough, everywhere he was going, he was healing people. In Matthew 4, it says he healed every disease. So not just the small things, but the big things. So as he's going from town to town, city to city, the crowd's growing bigger and bigger and bigger. What's he going to do next? What's he going to say? Who is he going to heal? What's going to happen? And the crowd gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And Jesus does what he does over and over again. In the midst of the crowd, he withdraws. And he climbs a hill, actually, this hill behind me. And he sits down. And the, the disciples finally realize that, that he's gone. And they see him on the hill. And, and they begin to climb the hill after him. And then... The crowd begins to come. Then Jesus stands up and he begins to teach. See, the miracles that Jesus did were awesome. I and mean, you got you to picture this. You got you have people who have never seen before. Their, their eyes haven't worked. And he speaks a word. He picks up some dirt. And they can see. 
People who are, who are lame, who have never walked a day in their life, have been picked up and carried and put on a mat everywhere they had to go. And they encounter Jesus and they walk. The dead, the, the, literally the dead are coming back to life. You, you're dead and now you're alive. I mean, the, the miracles were awesome. That's powerful stuff. That's probably Instagram worthy, right? You're, you can't walk. Now you can walk. I'm going to tweet that. Like, like I'm going to take a picture of that. I, I'm going to share that. That, that, that. That's important stuff. But I, got, I want you to see this. It's his words that were really causing the commotion. It wasn't really the miracles. It was his words that were causing the controversy. It was his words that were causing people to think, to think about their life, to think about God, to think about eternity. The miracles touched individuals, but it was his words that changed communities. The really cool thing about Jesus' words is this. Is they're just as powerful today as the day that he spoke them. See, his word does not return void. His, his word has the same power. Even though we weren't the original audience, it has the same power. His, his word, the Bible, and his words that we're seeing in the Sermon on the Mount, they can still impact our lives today. And, 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 and what Jesus was doing here, he's trying to bring order to confusion. There had been some confusion among the people, and their confusion was this. It was about the law and grace, and, and they were confused. So Jesus is saying, I'm not coming to replace the law. I'm not coming to get rid of the law. I'm coming to fulfill the law. See, as, as Christians, as believers, we believe that this book, the Bible, is literally God's word, that they were inspired. It's his words, and it's powerful. Jesus' sermon was inspired and it still has power today. And, and, and he really focuses on these three words. So far in his sermon, he's, he's really focusing on three different sections, three different words. The, the first word that he focuses on is this word, blessed. And we spent a whole Sunday walking through, blessed are, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. Blessed are, are, are this, blessed are that, blessed, blessed, blessed. And blessed is this deep inner joy that you have, that circumstances can't touch. It doesn't matter how bad of a day you are having, you are blessed and can still have joy. John calls the blessed life, abundant life, life to the fullness. See, life to the fullness is not dependent upon your circumstances. Life to the fullness is not dependent upon you having a good day or a bad day. It's, it's dependent upon your response to God. And see, what, what he's saying in, in the first section here is this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, meaning that even in your weakness, that's probably your biggest strength. Because in your weakness, now you're relying on God, and his strength becomes your strength. And now that can penetrate your life, so in your weakness you can be the strongest, because you're realizing that you're weak, so you're blessed to know God, now God can fill you up. He, he's flipping our whole idea about life on its head. Head. And then he begins to talk about this other word, this, this word kingdom. See, God is the king. And he gets his way through specific people. Now, the kingdom of God is not the church, but the church is the embodiment of the kingdom. And here is how it practically works. The church, the people of God, follow the king being God instead of culture. So the culture, our culture says you should live this way. This is what life should look like. This is what you should focus on. But God says something different. So we follow him as king and not what culture says. We follow him with our relationships. We follow him with our money. We follow him with our families. We follow him with our jobs. We follow him with our lives. Through the church, the world sees the kingdom of God. And sometimes they look and say, Christians are weird. 
And sometimes we are. I was going to say you are, but that was mean. So we are. Sometimes we are weird. And that's not what God's saying. He's not saying be a weird person, but be different. We are supposed to be different. Christians are supposed to look different than the world around us. See, we're supposed to have joy even in even hard times. We're supposed to have lives that are fulfilled. So, so if, you're, if you're not married, the Bible says not to have sex before marriage. Well, that's different than what the culture says. That's, that's weird. We are supposed to serve. We're supposed to love. We're supposed to get this, forgive. And forgive people that didn't earn it, that don't deserve it, but we are, we are to forgive. Why? Because he first forgave us. So who are we not to forgive somebody else when Jesus has forgiven us of so much? See, what is that? That's the kingdom of God. The Christians are supposed to look different because we are following a different king. I'm not following the king of this world. I'm not following Satan. I'm not, I'm not following culture. I'm following God. So I'm part of his kingdom. So I reflect him and, and his glory and what he says, not what culture is saying. So Jesus is talking about being blessed. He's talking about the kingdom. And the last few weeks, he's been talking about this other word, righteousness. He talked about it. He talked about murder, when, how murder starts in the heart. He talked, he talked about lust and, 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 and cheating on your spouse. He talked about how, how lust is the root to, to, to you cheating. He, he, he talks about it when he's talking about marriage. And he's talking about how, how, how we are to live rightly. See, righteousness is living up to God's standards. But how do we do this? Righteousness is hard. So what do we do? Do we just try really, really hard to be righteous? <laughs> no. The truth is you can't try really, really hard and be righteous, and neither can I. We live righteously through God's transforming power, not through your determination. See, you got to get this. To live up to God's standards, it requires God's power. You can't do it on your own. See, when you get saved, you put on the righteousness of God. What I mean by that is this. Before you were saved, you were in sin. You were lost in your sin. Ephesians 2 says you were dead in your sin. There was no hope for you. But when you confess your sin, when you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he rose from the dead, you repent of your sin, make him Lord of your life. In that moment, you put on Jesus' righteousness, meaning that if you stand before God, which we all will someday, he's not going to look at me and my joy. Junk, he's going to see Jesus in his righteousness. And because of Jesus' righteousness, now I can spend eternity with him. I'm part of his kingdom. Does that make sense? But see, Jesus is not really just talking about that type of righteousness in Matthew 5. He's talking about practical righteousness, meaning you, your practice is matching your position. Your behavior is matching your belief. So now if you say you're part of the kingdom of God, if you say that you are a Christian, then it should have practical implications on your life. And you should live righteously. And the truth is, none of us will have fully arrived in this life. None of, all of us fall short. But that's why we need him and his power. And this is where we're going to land this morning. And I, I know this is a long introduction, but I've got to get us to get this picture of what Jesus is saying and what it looks like to be a follower of Christ. See, our words require a transformation from God. We don't decide to just change our words. We allow God to change our heart. Then what we say and what we do, it, it transforms everything. Because words are powerful. 
There's this thing we used to say as a kid, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Lie. Has, have words ever hurt you? Even words from someone you despise can hurt you. Why? Because words have power. And they were always supposed to have power. Because we were made in the image of God. And his words have power. How did this world come to be? He spoke. It was his word. Words have power. So let's finally get to Matthew chapter 5. I know, long build up. Only a few verses. Like, oh my gosh, we're going to be here. Scott, there's a Wichita State game at noon. I know. Second half, all that matters anyway, so. Matthew chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible or an app on your phone or a tablet, it's a Bible in the seat back in front of you. You can keep that to get from us to you. We believe this is the Word of God, and since we believe that, we want you to read along with us. We want you to have one of these. That way you can study. The reason I don't just put the, the words on the screen is that I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to see for yourself that what I'm reading is what the Bible actually says. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 33. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but you shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make your own hair white or black. Let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. So here he's talking about words, and, and words are powerful, made the image of God, like I've already said. And the Sermon of the Mount, you've got to get this, is challenging the misunderstanding we see in the Old Testament. It's challenging people and what they were, what they were saying. See, see, Jesus is actually standing on the shoulders of the Ten Commandments. He did not come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. So he's standing on the shoulders of it, but people were trying to say that it was different. So there's just all this miscommunication and misunderstanding. And so he's connecting what he's saying here to the Ten Commandments. Now, how many of you know the Ten Commandments? Raise your hand. Anybody? Want, how many of you can recite them all right now? Oh. Couple of us. <laughs> okay, okay, good. That's, that's more than first service. So that's what we're doing. We're doing good. So we know the Ten Commandments are important, right? But we don't necessarily know what they are. And so what, what he's doing is he's, he's trying to connect the dots. So let me give you a quick little refresher. Be very, very quickly. Let me summarize them for us. Commandment number one is this. Have no other God before me. Meaning, don't put anything else in God's place. So nothing's before him. Nothing's, he is primary. He's most important. He, he is number one. Do we, good, do, we, do we do well at that all the time? Okay, we're 0 for 1. Commandment number two. Don't make graven images. We're like, well, Scott, I can't even carve. So I, I, I think I'm okay. No, no. It, it, meaning this, don't reduce God to something you can put in your pocket. Don't reduce God to something that, that you can control. See, both of commandments number one and number two deal with idolatry. And you might say, but Scott, I, I don't have idols. You don't? You don't put anything before God? Okay, well, well, well maybe that one, but I don't have a little idol that I've carved and I bow down to and I kiss. Okay, but do you put God in a box? Do you limit God? Do you minimize God? You know, I say, but, but Scott, I don't, I don't think so. Okay, let's go deeper. <laughs> this whole God life thing. So God, when I'm a Christian, he wants to penetrate all of my life. But do I have a God life and then a business life? 
So I'm this way when I'm around Christians, when I'm at church, when I'm talking to God, but in my business, I'm this way. Or do I have a school life? Where I'm this way at church, but when I'm with my other friends, I'm this other way. Do we have a God life and then a private life? Do we have a God life and then our sex life? Let me go deeper. Do we have a God life and then our taxes life? It's just a little number here or there. It's not a big deal. Do we, do we separate God out and say, here is my God life, but these, er these other areas of my life aren't that big of a deal, so I'm going to do them my way. What, when we do that, we put God in a box. Your whole life is your God life. You can't reduce them to anything else. And when we do, we are committing idolatry. So really, the first two commandments were O for two. So get this. Commandment number one and commandment number two deal with the root of sin. Meaning, this is what causes sin. Then commandment 3 through 10 talks about the fruit of sin. So now that sin has taken root, I want my will, I want my way, I am more important than God and his will, then this is how it looks in my life. Now I can steal because I want something that I don't have. So now the root is my idolatry, my will, my way, but now the action is me stealing. So one through two are, are the root, three through ten are the fruit of sin. And I want to deal with number, number nine today because number nine goes exactly with what Jesus is saying here in Matthew chapter five. Commandment number nine is don't bear false witness. What does that mean? Stop lying. Let me ask you a question. You're in church. How many of you lie? Raise your hand. Okay, we got some liars. But I'm not talking about those with the hands up. I'm talking about those with the hands down. <laughs> We've got a bunch of liars. See, the Old Testament talks about this, and Jesus is talking about this, and, it, and, it, and it's pretty simple, right? Stop lying. Simple. So don't lie, you shouldn't lie. But here's what religious people do. God says something very, very simple. Don't do this, this is wrong. But then religious people come and we add rules to it. So the, the law is don't lie. But then we add four, five, six rules saying, well, don't do this and don't do this and don't do this and don't do this. And if you don't do all these things, then you'll never lie. And so that's why God gave us 10 commandments and the church gave us 800 rules for those 10 commandments. So what we did with maybe with good intentions is saying, here is the law. We're going to add these rules to protect us from going past the law. And that is legalism. And let me show you why that is so important and why it's so dangerous. Here's the problem with legalism. Here's the problem with adding rules to God's law. You just became self-righteous. Because what I already say. I said this, you cannot be righteous on your own. Neither can I. We need him. But instead of going to him, we see the law and we know we're going to break it. So we try to put all these other things in place to protect us. So instead of us going to God, we become God and we try to protect ourselves, which is idolatry. Then what do we do? We break the law. So do you see how this is just a, a mixed up a bundle of junk? And that's what Jesus is addressing. He's saying, look, you church, you've added all of these rules. You've added all of this stuff. 
And really what it is is self-righteousness. It's you trying to save yourself. It's you in your own strength trying to be righteous, but you can't do it. Every time you make a rule or a law outside of God's revelation, we reduce God and elevate ourselves. Because about us and our strength. And this was what was wrong with the church. And this is what is wrong with the church. The world says, what does the kingdom of God look like? And they look to the church, and what do they see? Rules. Well, I, I just can't be a Christian. You have too many rules. We have 10 laws. Is that too many? Well, but all these other things, you have to dress a certain way to come to church, and, you, you, and real worship is like this and not like this, and, and you got to do this, and you got to do that, and you got to do all these different things. That's all legalism. That's the church adding rules to try to keep us away from breaking the law, which is really self-righteousness. And the world's saying, what makes the church different? What's the kingdom of God look like? And all they see is a bunch of rules. And they want nothing to do with that. They want the power of God. They want something that will transform their life. But yet they see all this legalism and that's not from God. And this is what Jesus is blowing up in our text. Self-righteousness. See, in the culture that Jesus is speaking to, and you, and you wouldn't just know this, so, you, so when you read the verses this morning, you're like, oh, and this and that, and the head, and what is he talking about? In, in, in the culture he's speaking to, the religious people, they created a system. The law was, do not lie. That's the law. But we know that we're going to lie. So what we do is we create a system to, help, to keep us from lying. So these series of oaths, meaning if I say this oath, then it's not really that big of a deal if I lie. It's just, just a little white lie. But if I say this oath, it has a little bit more meaning. And if I say this oath, then I really, really mean it, and I'm telling the truth. In our world, it'd be like this. Scott, did you break the window? No. Do you promise you didn't break the window? Yeah, I promise. I didn't break the window. Do you swear? Swear your mama's grave? Okay, I broke the window. Why does it build up? He's saying you've made this, this system to where now you can lie. It's only a little white lie. It's not a big deal. He's saying, get rid of all that junk. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Just speak the truth. See, what we do is we add rules to justify our actions. Well, I followed all the rules. Yeah, but you still lied. Yes, I lied, but I went through this whole process. I made this oath. I considered their feelings. This is how I see the truth. I love this one in our culture. This is my truth. What does that mean? If it's truth, it's your truth, it's my truth, it's all the truth. But here's what we mean by that. The Bible says this, but I don't like that. So that's not my truth. Here is my truth. You just justified your actions. You found a way to try to say what you are doing is okay. It's a justification for sin. See, when we complicate things, we don't think we have to be accountable. But let me, let me tell you this morning, God doesn't need our help. His system doesn't need our help. Our lives need his help. Jesus is getting right to the heart of the issue here. He's saying, you have all of these oaths. I don't care. You're lying. And he's saying, in, in your world, you are showing them something different than what the kingdom of God should be. And in our world, we do the same thing. So the question might be is, is God against oaths and vows? Not necessarily. We see oaths and vows in the Bible. Jesus is really talking about authority. 
This is why it says, don't swear by your own head. You can't make your hair white or black. And some of you are like, I got this hair girl and she hooks me up. Like she gets rid of the gray. Yeah, for like two weeks. Then it comes back, right? You think you don't have the power to change your own hair color. Why are you swearing by your own head? What he's really saying is, you're swearing by your own authority that you don't even have. See, when you're a Christian, your words are not about your authority. It's about the one whose authority you are under. An authority that's greater than yourself. When, when a president, or you go to court, but if you, go to, if you, go to, if you get, become a president, you have your inauguration, invite me, I'd like to come if you become president someday. You put your hand on something, right? I swear to keep the kin, the, not Ten Commandments. <laughs> That's not what they do. <laughs> That'd be nice. That would be nice. I, I, I swear to hold the Constitution and blah, blah, blah. They put their hand on their Bible. Why? They put their hand on an authority that's greater than themselves. It's about authority. When you go to court, you put your hand on the Bible. Why? It's about authority authority. And Jesus is saying, you're making all of these rules that make you the authority, but you're not the authority. You can't make your own truth. You can't go outside of the truth. You can't change the truth. But Scott, I don't like the truth. Tough. You don't critique truth. Truth critiques you. It critiques me. But Scott, I don't take oaths. Maybe not, but you still lie. You're all a bunch of liars. Wish you could have saw your face just now. <laughs> and so am I. We're all a bunch of liars. I want you to see this. Our lies, most of the time, are connected to our idol. When you meet a pastor and you're a pastor, in the first 30 seconds, they're going to ask you a question, typically. What do you think it is? How many are you running? See, in our city, statistics tell us that we're the second least church city in the Midwest. And based upon church's stated attendance, 10% of our city is in church today. Why'd I say stated attendance? Because a church is going to say their attendance is their Easter number times two. It's big, way bigger. Well, we've, we, one time we had this amount of people, and really I think we're more than that, so here's our number. So Scott, how many are you running? 750. 750? 400. The last three weeks have been over 400, the last three weeks. Is there anything wrong with that? No. Why would I be tempted to lie? Because I have an idol. I am tempted to lie because I have a power idol. I want to win. And I want to show that we are always winning. How are things going? Oh, it's going great. Everything's great. Everything's awesome. Everything's so awesome. Is everything awesome? No, it's not. But I have an idol, so I lie. And so do you. Some of you have a control idol. You want to be in control of everything. And here you are at your job, and you're, you have, you're just you're pulling your hair out, if you even have hair. And you're stressed out and you don't know what to do. And your boss comes to you and says, how is it going? And what do you say? I got it. Everything's good. Everything's fine. What are you saying? I don't want your hands in my stuff. I'll fix it myself. I want to control it. So I'll lie to you so that I can be in control. Some of you have a comfort idol. And somebody comes who's going to cause you discomfort. You're like, oh no, not this person. I don't want to talk to them. They say, hey, you got plans for lunch tomorrow? 
Yep, got plans. <laughs> Catch you next time. You got no plans? You're not that popular. But instead of saying, hey, you know what? I really don't want to do this. We lie. And we don't want to have an uncomfortable conversation. And so we lie. Some of us are great at exaggerating. If you're a public speaker, you struggle with this. The truth is when I'm telling a story, especially about my family, and you start laughing, the story will get longer and get bigger. Why? Because you're laughing. And so I exaggerate, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and guess what? You lie too. Best movie ever. You never take out the trash. You're always late. Exaggerations. It's a lie. We, we will lie because we don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. It's not you, it's me. No, it's you. We're breaking up because you call me all the time. It's you. It's all you. But we don't hurt their feelings. It's not you. It's just me. I'm in, a, I'm in a different space in my mind right now. I'm in this place of my life right now. I just don't want a boyfriend or a girlfriend. I'm just, I'm just in this place. No, you're not. You're on Tinder. <laughs> First service, I didn't come out. I don't know where that came from, this service. <laughs> and you're swiping. It's not, no, it's them. It's them. It's them. You just tell, but instead of being honest, we make up an excuse. So let me ask you again. How many of you lie? Well, we're getting better. We're all liars, guys. And our words are powerful. And we, we, we try to create these rules and we try to justify what we do. And the problem is we're reflecting the world and not reflecting the kingdom of God. We are supposed to be different. We're supposed to li li live different. We're supposed to talk different. We're supposed to be different. See, when I get up here to preach, I want to tell you the truth. And you might not always like it. I might step on your toes. My intention is not to harm you, but to help you. But with that being said, if you're uncomfortable, you're uncomfortable. Why? It's not about you liking me. It's not about me presenting something in a way where you're like, okay, that fits better with how I see the truth. No, I'm to give you the truth. Why? Because I'm preaching under his authority and it's his word and I can't change it to make it feel better for you. So we have to accept what it's saying and wrestle it out with our life. See, here's the truth. And it's different than what culture says. There is one way to heaven. You being a religious person, you coming to church, you doing nice things, none of that will save you. That's your own righteousness. But Scott, I put it on Facebook. I showed everybody the nice things that I did. That's your righteousness. Not his. You don't want to stand before God under your righteousness. You want to stand before God under Jesus' righteousness. So the only way to get his righteousness is if you surrender your life to him. So I confess you are God. I confess that you rose from the dead. Forgive me of my sin. Be the Lord of my life. And he gives you his righteousness. So no longer is it about you it's about him. You are now under authority. And he covers you. See, here's the truth as well. We can all get better at living out the truth. See, when we speak the truth and our words don't match up with our life, we're 
lying. Our lives are lying. And the truth is that this world needs to see what the kingdom of God is really like. And they're not going to see a perfect church because you're in it and I'm in it. But they need to see a church that better reflects Christ. We have to realize that we are under his authority. We reflect him. And we need to stop adding rules and justifications and start submitting to his authority and living out and speaking the truth. I would much rather you tell me the truth than you lie to me. It would hurt in the moment, but I can handle that. It's the lie that just hangs around. Let's have our lives be truth and our words be truth. Let's pray. God, we come before you this morning as people who are under authority. And it's not my authority. It's not anybody in this room's authority. It's your authority. So God, we submit to you and your authority. God, we repent if there's areas of our life where we've been lying, we've been living a lie, we've been telling a lie, we've been being self-righteous, trying to save ourselves, trying to justify our actions. God, we lay all that down this morning and we say, we submit to you. We surrender to your truth. We surrender to your will and your way. We cannot save ourselves. But we need you. We're not righteous in ourselves, But in you we are. God, I pray if there's anybody in here, anybody watching online who does not know you, that right now they would surrender their life to you. We can't save ourselves. So they would say, Jesus, the one who came and died on the cross for my sins, the blood that was shed as a payment for my sin, took the judgment on yourself for me. I confess you are God. Confess you rose from the dead. Forgive me. I repent. I've blown it. Be the Lord of my life. Put your righteousness on me. So when people see me, they see you. When God sees me, he sees you. Save me. Make me. God, I pray that we would be a church that reflects you better. That our community would look at us and say, something different about those people. And it's not our rules. It's us following your way. Help us to show that, we pray. And in Jesus' name.